if we try to use enolates in conjugate addition reactions, we generally get a mixture of 1,4 and 1,2 addition if we're reacting with, for example, an alpha beta unsaturated ketone. So here I've drawn an example of an enolate in the presence of an alpha beta unsaturated ketone. And when we mix these, we're generally met with a mixture of 1,4 addition products through electron flow like this and 1,2 addition products through electron flow like this. And so Enolates are not really great to use in uh, nucleophilic additions to alpha beta unsaturated carbonyl compounds because we're going to get a messy mixture of products. In this video, we're going to see how we can use enamines to circumvent this problem. The lower reactivity and generally greater softness, quote unquote, of the enamine nucleophile means that it adds selectively at the beta carbon of alpha beta unsaturated carbonyl compounds. This enables us to do conjugate additions that look like Michael reactions of enolates after hydrolysis of an amine or aminium intermediate, but that don't actually involve enolate intermediates. So let's dig into this. So as we just saw, simple enolates, unstabilized enolates, give mixtures of 1,2 and 1,4 addition with alpha-beta unsaturated carbonyl compounds, a mixture of addition to the beta carbon and the carbonyl carbon. But enamines, because they are softer and less reactive than enolates, engage in selective conjugate addition with unsaturated carbonyls. And this is called stork alkylation in honor of the discoverer of the reaction, Gilbert Stork. And it involves formation of an enamine followed by treatment with an alpha-beta unsaturated ketone or aldehyde. So the basic idea of the reaction is we start with a ketone that we want to act as our nucleophile. And our goal here is to alkylate, install an alkyl group through a conjugate addition process at the beta carbon of an electrophile. So this is our nucleophile, and we start by forming an enamine of that by condensing it with some secondary amine. Here it's pyrrolidine, which is very commonly used for this purpose. So a molecule of water is lost. This is just enamine formation, which we've seen before. And then we treat with the alpha-beta unsaturated ketone. And because of the softness and low reactivity of the enamine, it adds selectively to the beta carbon through electron flow that looks like this. Analogous to conjugate addition type of electron flow that we've seen previously. So we get on one end, on kind of the left half of the molecule, we get an aminium ion. And on the right half, we get an enolate. And protonation of this enolate ultimately leads to a neutral compound after hydrolysis of the aminium ion as well. So pyrrolidine is lost here. Water adds in to this aminium carbon, and after proton transfers and elimination of the pyrrolidine, we end up with a carbonyl group here. It's a good opportunity to pause if you need to and think through the mechanism of hydrolysis of this aminium. And the enolate just becomes a neutral ketone through proton transfer to the alpha carbon, right? And so notice this product is a 1,5-dicarbonyl. It looks like it came from addition of an enolate right here to an alpha-beta unsaturated ketone. We did this indirectly using the enamine nucleophile as a kind of enolate surrogate or enolate stand-in, right, that avoids 1,2 addition because of the softness of the enamine. So this is stork alkylation, and it's a great way to alkylate alpha to a carbonyl group. This is a method we can use, for example, in lieu of the acetoacetic ester synthesis or something along those lines to create a carbon-carbon bond at the alpha carbon of a carbonyl compound. We can also acylate enamines at the alpha carbon. And recall that we've done this previously using Claisen type condensation, using an ester as the electrophile, for example, in the presence of a ketone or ester enolate. Enamines are less reactive than enolates. And for this reason, they actually can be used in conjunction with acyl chlorides without acylation of the nitrogen atom or without acylation at nitrogen that is actually problematic. Um, these give high yields of the alpha carbon acylated product, in contrast to ester enolates and ketone enolates, where we saw enol esters generally form. So this is kind of nice. Stork acylation allows us to use acyl chlorides, highly reactive, in conjunction with enamine nucleophiles to give products that look like they came from a clasin, but involved an enamine intermediate. So we start 
with the ketone that we want to acylate, aldehydes can also be used. We condense with a secondary amine, such as pyrrolidine and uh, acid, acetic acid. This generates an enamine intermediate, and then we treat that enamine solution, enamine-containing solution, with the acyl chloride. And the idea here is acylation. This actually looks very similar to the Claisen-type electron flow that we've seen previously. So nucleophilic addition occurs first, and although I'm not going to show it, if need be, pause the video and draw curved arrows and the tetrahedral intermediate involving beta elimination, this reestablishes the CO double bond, kicks out chloride, and the resulting structure we get looks like this. So it's an aluminium ion where the alpha carbon has added an acyl group right here. So it's an alpha acylation, just like the Claisen condensation, but involving an enamine nucleophile as opposed to an enolate. And after hydrolysis of this intermediate aluminium ion, we end up with a carbonyl group where the aluminium was. And so we end up with a 1,3 dicarbonyl compound, classic product of a Claisen type condensation. So this provides an alternative to the Claisen condensation and actually avoids some of the limitations that we've previously seen. For example, this has the potential to work great at a substituted um, ketone where we have only one alpha hydrogen. We can still form an enamine that can still react with the acyl chloride and we can still get to a 1,3 dicarbonyl compound, for example, with additional substituents at the alpha carbon. One idea that these two reactions give us is what if we try to hit an enamine with an alkyl halide? Notice that's sort of conspicuously missing from these two reactions. We've used an acyl chloride and an alpha beta unsaturated ketone, two now familiar electrophiles to us, but probably the first electrophile you ever saw was an alkyl halide. What happens if we hit an enamine with an alkyl halide? Well, neutral enamines are actually problematic with simple alkyl halides like methyl, benzyl, bromide because of alkylation of the nitrogen atom. That can create problems. However, if we deprotonate the enamine, if we have an enamine that has an NH and we deprotonate it, the enamine anion that results can be cleanly alkylated with alkyl halides at the alpha position. And that's this third stoichiometric reaction we'll look at, at through what's called a metalloenamine. And a, a nice way to think about it, really the best way to think about it is it involves condensation to form an imine intermediate with alpha hydrogens and a strong base is used to remove one of those alpha protons creating something that looks like an enolate, but with an N minus replacing the O minus of an enolate. So for example here, we're starting with propanol, an aldehyde, and condensing it with tert butylamine using acetic acid as our acid catalyst here. This creates an imine, and upon treatment with ethyl Grignard, now this, typically we're used to this as a nucleophile. It can also be used as a base, and it turns out to be a fantastic base in this context to deprotonate at the alpha position. Once it does that, we end up with a reactive intermediate that, again, looks a lot like an enolate. It's just we have an NR minus group here instead of an O minus like we'd have in an enolate. Right? And this is still profoundly nucleophilic at that alpha carbon. In fact, more nucleophilic than an enolate. Right? This is even more reactive than an enolate. And so now if we treat with an alkyl halide, and here we'll want it to be primary or methyl, right, to avoid elimination issues on the alkyl halide side, we can get something that resembles an SN2 reaction with the nucleophilic alpha carbon displacing bromide, and we've made a new carbon carbon bond. So this is an alkylation reaction with a simple alkyl halide with the nucleophile being what's called a metalloenamine. And metallo because the magnesium cation is kind of following around that negatively charged nitrogen in this reaction. And we can imagine that if the imine is not really our goal, if we want to get back to a CO double bond, well, that's just hydrolysis, right? We can use acid, water, hydrolysis conditions, and we'll kick off that tert butylamine and get back to the carbonyl compound. Notice that this looks like it came from an alkylation of an enolate, right, where the new carbon-carbon bond was formed right there, and it sort of did. It just used the nitrogen analog, used the enamine anion as opposed to an enolate. So these reactions of metalloenamines are a great way to establish carbon-carbon bonds using simple alkyl halide electrophiles.